Okay, welcome to the first lesson of this course where I'll be discussing why we code, including an introduction to scientific data analysis, some important principles of programming, and an overview of the Python programming language. This lecture will be comprised of four segments, which are meant to be watched in order from start to finish, but definitely feel free to take breaks and watch them separately, whatever works for you. Also note that auto captioning should be available for this video. So if having a written transcription of what I'm saying would be helpful for you, you can turn that setting on in Panopto. So the topic of this first segment is scientific data analysis. What does it look like and why do we do it? We'll also cover some general principles of programming, then zoom into Python and talk about its advantages relative to other languages. And then we'll finish with an overview of the various ways you can write code in Python. So what can data tell us? We're looking here at an animation showing the summertime thickness of sea ice in the Arctic Ocean uh, from 1979 to present day. And as you might know, sea ice is just frozen seawater. It floats on top of the ocean. And the data giving us information about how thick it is comes from satellites and climate models. Here are these brighter colors uh, mean thicker ice. And there's a scale at the bottom that tells you how those colors correspond to thickness in meters. So what can we learn from this? Well, for one, ice is clearly getting thinner over the years, though it's consistently thick, thickest uh, near Greenland over here. You can see Greenland in those white outlines. So a map of the Arctic Ocean. You might also notice that its thickness changes a lot year to year, but the general pattern basically stays the same. Now this is a lot of sea ice data here, but the beauty of programming is that it allows you to create customized visualizations like these, which are often really the only way to make sense of this much data. So now let me show you some more examples uh, from oceanography and marine science. So here's one. Imagine you're interested in protecting ecosystems in the ocean around Antarctica. You might want to pass laws to make some areas off limits to fishing, for instance. But how do you figure out which areas to choose? Well, the authors of this paper wanted to do exactly that. And what they did is tag 4,000 seabirds and marine mammals, like seals, penguins, and whales, with little GPS tracking devices. Now, 4,000 is a big number, but it's not nearly as big as the number of individual locations that were recorded by those GPS loggers. 2.9 million locations were recorded as those animals moved throughout the waters around Antarctica. And you can see those GPS tracks on this figure on the left. And clearly they're so tightly packed in some spots that it's hard to make sense of what's going on. Now for a task like this, computer code is essential. It allowed those authors to transform those 2.9 million points into this beautiful map on the right of overall habitat importance, which is basically a synthesis of the density of those GPS tracks. And this result let the authors recommend certain areas for protection with a confidence that protecting those regions would really have a substantial benefit because they've shown quantitatively here that there's a lot of marine life concentrated there. I should mention that if you want to read more about this paper or the others that I'll show, you can uh, click on the links in the PDF version of these slides. Okay, so two more examples here. Now on the left, the authors collected sediment cores, which are basically long tubes of mud from the ocean floor that have slowly accumulated over one and a half million years. And then they went and measured the chemistry of fossilized organisms in that mud. That produced a lot of data points. So programming for them came to the rescue and let them create these graphs, which show variations of chemistry on the top and temperature on the bottom uh, on these y-axes against time on the x-axis. And these wiggles up and down might look small, but they actually represent giant changes in ocean circulation over these past one and a half million years. And the authors think that these variations affected the timing of ice ages. So on the right, we have another paper, and uh, it's actually by a graduate student in oceanography. What she did is use data from a ship-mounted device that sends pulses of sound into the water and listens for echoes as that sound reflects off things like, ship, like fish. Um, and it turns out that these sound pulses actually reflect off of temperature and salinity layers also. Um, and that can tell you how heat and salt move around in the water column, in this case, in the Arctic Ocean. Um, those are both very important physical processes. So just given a few examples of really rich data in oceanography and marine science, and I can promise you that by the end of this course, you'll be able to turn data into graphics every bit as interesting and revealing as these. And it's not just oceanography. 
So the most exciting research in the broader earth science realm is more often than not made possible also by computational data analysis. Uh, whether that those data are from satellites looking at forests or seismograms looking at earthquakes, hydrometric gauges looking at river flooding, uh, air quality measurements being connected to human mortality, uh, aircraft mounted instruments looking at oil and gas emissions, or even data collected by spacecraft looking at the sun. So every corner of the earth sciences uses and needs data. And it's not just the earth sciences, of course, it's uh, data science broadly itself is one of the fastest growing fields and it's worked its way into just about every aspect of everyday life, whether that's tracking the pandemic, calculating driving distances that route you around traffic jams, uh, predicting the outcome of a basketball game even, or finding evidence of racially biased police stops in Seattle. And notice the diversity of data that goes into these examples. We have internet search data, uh, phone data, individualized metrics, court records. So to summarize who uses data, the answer is everyone. Everyone uses data. And uh, just a side note, if you're curious about the many ways that data can be used in service of racial justice, I encourage you to check out these two links at the bottom in the PDF version of these slides. Okay. So what is the process for using data in science? If the scientific method came to mind, you wouldn't be wrong. But the thing is, science these days often looks pretty different than what we think of as the traditional scientific method. So here I'm showing that process, which sometimes still starts by framing your question. Except the most interesting questions you might ask these days are often constrained by what data is available. And that's not the traditional scientific method. So for instance, for that Arctic sea ice animation I showed, which is at the top right here, the question might be, how does sea ice thickness change year to year? But until recently, that's not a question you could answer because there just wasn't enough data. But now there is, so we're basically starting by identifying a data set and then going back up here uh, to see what questions we think we can answer using it. So with a question and some data in hand, now you gotta write a bit of code to start analyzing it. And in the case of the sea ice animation, that was about four pages of Python code, code that you will be able to write by hand uh, by the end of this quarter. Um, and then you run the code. And trust me, the code never runs right the first time. So you go back, you debug, uh, you fix things and repeat, and eventually, hopefully, you get some cool result. Sometimes that result points you in a different direction and you're back to the drawing board to change your motivating question. Uh, or maybe the original data wasn't enough, like here the graphic doesn't really tell you why sea ice thickness is changing year to year, so perhaps you want to bring in some air temperature data. You're back to collecting some more data. Or maybe the original data was rich enough that there's more to discover in it, so you write some more code. Or maybe the result you got was interesting because it was wrong, in which case you probably have to fix your code and try again. So broadly speaking, this is how data analysis often works, and the final project in this course will give you some practice following this model. But why do we go to all the trouble of writing code when there are you know, useful apps out there like Microsoft Excel that have a lot of great built-in features already. Why reinvent the wheel? Well, sometimes that's fine. You can manage to string together a workflow that gets what you want done, like this one where you might download some data in Chrome or another browser and clean it up in Excel, manipulate it statistically in Stata, and then uh, plug it into, say, Ocean Data View to make some maps. The problem with this is that prepackaged solutions like apps are great when what they do is what you want but often you're gonna to wanna to do something that they can't do. And then you're stuck unless you know how to write code. Uh, so programming, uh, I like the analogy of it being like a Swiss army knife. It's powerful because it's versatile and it can serve a lot of functions all in one package. So while apps like Excel uh, often seem like they're saving you time, as you get more comfortable with, with writing code, you'll start to find that it's faster, it's more efficient, it's even more reliable to write code than do things in Excel, in Excel or other specialized programs. So um, to emphasize again, specifically because Katie and I have seen a lot of students using Excel heavily for, for senior theses, anything you can do in Excel, you can do that and more in Python. Okay, so that is it for this first segment. If you're moving straight to the next segment, definitely suggest getting up, doing some stretches, stepping away from the screen for a second. Uh, thanks for watching, we'll be, we'll be back.